Hello and welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about the early Italian Renaissance, and this time we're really definitely into the Renaissance. This is, there's no proto-Renaissance, there's no debate. We're actually in the time period now from the year 1400 on where the Renaissance happens. When exactly it happens, no one can say, but it's definitely in that period. And it also kind of has a clear birthplace, and that's going to be Florence. So just to orient you, this is, of course, Italy. Rome is located here, and Florence is up here in Tuscany. Florence itself is largely set down in the Middle Ages and is pretty much a medieval town. We're going to be looking at this section here predominantly. Here you can see the crowded uh, medieval streets. But it's in this context that... Uh, the Renaissance, as we understand it, first gets going. It's also important to note that there is this major issue of patronage still around. Uh, remember, these medieval cities are kind of divided up into neighborhoods, and each one is ruled by a prominent family. They even had towers to defend territory. Uh, there was nothing like a municipal police force. There was nothing like a kind of unified government. It was very fractious. Uh, there was, uh, you know, basically a kind of republican form of government, but there was lots of power plays. And the most important of these families, although there were several important families, is going to be the Medicis. The Medicis start off as textile merchants. It's very important to know that they're not a noble family. That's actually critical to understanding them. They had a kind of monopoly on the production of alum. Alum is this uh, mineral that is, exists and needed in the production of textiles, and they had very strong connections to textile merchants up in what would be Flanders, modern-day Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, and so they started as textile merchants. They were very, very successful. And then they became so successful, they had all of this extra money. Well, what do you do if you have extra money? You become a banker. And that's the natural pro progression. Anybody who starts off making a successful product will eventually be so successful, they'll move into finance. And everybody does that. And after you get really successful in finance, what do you do? You move into the one area where you can make even more money. That's right, through graft and corruption by taking over the government. And that's that's exactly what they did. The funny thing is the Medicis always ran things behind the scenes like uh, some capo or some don from a, a criminal family. Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, probably the most important of the Medicis in the second half of the Quattrocento, actually uh, never really held political office, but he was the de facto ruler of uh, all of Florence. And as I mentioned, he was kind of a bad A dude. I mean, it, really nobody would mess with him. Survived several assassination attempts. I think I made the joke before, but if Game of Thrones had the Medicis in it, uh, they would have cleared out the dragons and the White Walkers by the first couple of seasons and just spent the next several seasons making fabulous art. Now, getting to the art, why did they patronize art? Now, remember, these guys aren't nobles. They're not nobles by birth. They don't really have any claim to the power that they hold. They just did it by a whole bunch of backdoor machinations and etc. And they're very, very sensitive about this. So it's very important to remember that the Medicis are not nobles by birth. They do not have status by birth. What they've got is cash. They're the nouveau riche. Now, what happens when somebody gets a lot of cash? Well, what you want is recognition. You want prestige. You have capital, that is cash and power, but what you really want is social capital. And you can accomplish that in a variety of ways. You can accomplish that by intermarrying into prominent noble families, and they certainly did that, but you also do it through the avenues of taste and patronage. That is, you try to prove to the rest of the world that you deserve your status in society. And you see this everywhere you go where you have a nouveau riche, a middle class emerge. They try to redefine tastes and prove that they have these high tastes. So they became collectors and antiquarians and massive patrons of the arts. So one of the first real tests of the Renaissance is going to be the competition for the doors to the baptistry. So here is the very famous Duomo. This is uh, the cathedral of the city. And right in front of it, you have this eight-sided building, which is a baptistry. It's a very elaborate building uh, to perform uh, baptisms in. It's covered in marble. The interior is pretty much done in a Byzantine style with these Byzantine mosaics. But in the year 1400, 27 uh, very prominent families came together to create a competition, saying... We really want a fancy set of doors for this baptistry. Wouldn't it be great if we could get the best artist for it? 
And so they decided to hold a competition, and the Medicis were a major force pushing behind this. Uh, dozens of artists competed, but eventually it came down to two artists, and they asked all of the artists involved to create a kind of test sample of what you would do for these doors. And they actually gave them a subject. The subject was the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. And so these test panels were produced. When you take a look at these test panels, they're relatively small. Uh, they're done. They have this wonderful quatrefoil uh, pattern, which is a pretty gothic pattern. You know, interesting. They're still following the conventions of the previous era. The story of the sacrifice of Isaac is a very important story out of the Bible. Uh, it's a test of Abraham. Abraham is ordered to sacrifice his son. He, it's his only son, and he only got this son after a long time uh, without having a son in his old age. And so it's a huge sacrifice for him to sacrifice his own son. But at the last moment, an angel comes and interrupts him and prevents him from killing his own son. And so therefore you have this kind of moment where God tests him. Uh, and so you see the, the same kind of things in both scenes. Uh, you see Abraham in the middle. Uh, this one, Abraham, is uh, this one over on the left. Uh, you can see that the knife is right against Isaac's poor throat uh, over here. Uh, and the angel has to reach in and grab Abraham's hand to stop him. Over on the right, you can see that the angel's kind of flying in at the last moment. Both cases uh, were considered very, very good. But ultimately, Ghiberti uh, rose to the top. So this is Ghiberti's on the right, Brunelleschi's on the left. And I think you can see why Ghiberti's was chosen as this dramatic upsweep of stone. You have the servants below uh, and you have this displayed body. But I think what's really interesting here is the conscious historicism. Remember we talked about in the Italian Renaissance, one of the things that really motivates the Italian artists is this attempt to reclaim the classical past and to reinterpret the classical past. And you can see that. Let's look at Brunelleschi's. If you look at Brunelleschi's down here in this lower corner, you have a character and he's actually crouched over and holding his foot. What he's doing is he's actually pulling a thorn out of his foot. It's really kind of amazing. You can see the foot right there. And this is a direct copy of a very famous Hellenistic piece of sculpture uh, that was part of the collections of one of these uh, uh, noble families, and it is the spine or the thorn puller, where you have this just wonderful little, you know, kind of genre or everyday scene of a boy pulling a thorn out of his foot. So this is a conscious quotation. If you want to think of it this way, this is fan art. This is Brunelleschi saying, hey, you know, this is this great piece of Hellenistic art. For his part, Ghiberti is doing much the same thing. When you look at the torso of Isaac, you can see how much it is modeled on classical uh, precedents, that you have all of this ornate uh, anatomy, this incredible classical anatomy. So while Ghiberti got the nod and he won the contest, both artists were clearly moving into a much more classical direction. The final doors, as composed, really are a marvel and may be uh, one of the first true works of the Renaissance. Uh, they consist of several bronze uh, panels that are gilt and set into bronze frames. These recently underwent a massive restoration. Uh, and in fact, the actual panels aren't there anymore. Reproductions are put there uh, to keep them safe. But here you can see the individual panels. The panels are noted for a couple of things. One, they employ uh, what we call a continuous narrative or a conflated narrative. This one tells the story of the creation of Adam and the fall. So here you see Adam down here being created uh, and he is placed in the garden and then you see him sleeping here and Eve being created out of his rib. God appears here as well. Eventually they get tempted by the serpent uh, and they take the fruit and then eventually they end up being expelled. You can actually see there's this kind of floating door here and God is flying in to expel them from the Garden of Eden. So you have the whole story is kind of summed up in one compact image. So compositionally, the image is pretty, you know, compact. But when we look at the figures, notice how classical the figures are. We have uh, accurate anatomy, uh, figures posed. Notice the figure here, where she puts her hand over her 
uh, lower parts. This is clearly a kind of reference to the Capitoline Venus, a very famous uh, classical statue. When we see all the panels together, they really are compelling. They tell the story of Genesis, so the early stories out of the Bible, uh, right here after the, this is the creation and the fall of man, right here we have the scene of Noah. And boy, do we have a trippy scene of Noah. So what you're seeing here is various scenes again in the life of Noah. This strange pyramid-like contraption here is in fact the ark. <laughs> so you have this strange thing, you have the birds flying out of the top, animals coming out of it, and this is the family of Noah here. Down here is a scene of the drunkenness of Noah. It's not a scene you often get told in Sunday school, <laughs> but it's a story where Noah uh, parties after uh, coming out of the ark, gets drunk, and uh, uh, gets exposed, and uh, two of his sons walk backwards to cover him up with a, uh, uh, a uh, cloak to cover his nakedness. So again, that conflated narrative. But again, look at how classical the figures are. Look at the accurate drapery, uh, the weight shift of the figures, the dynamic quality of the figures. There's one other thing that's popping up in all of these scenes, and it's the incredible rendering of space and the believable sense of depth. Uh, depth. So here we have a panel from the Baptistry Doors. This is the history of Joseph. And you can see that we have the house of Potiphar here. And in the house of Potiphar, uh, we have this really amazing circular structure, believable perspective. You can see that even better here in this scene dealing uh, with the story of Jacob and Esau, where Jacob and Esau compete for the, uh, the birthright. Um, and look at this perspective. Look at how the figures are now in a believable scale and format. Notice how all the lines of the tiles converge in one direction. And this is something that's going to set the Renaissance apart. That is that finally we have a sense of depth and we have this sense of illusionism. The Renaissance is noted for bringing about this kind of sense of mathematical perspective. Mathematical perspective is an invention of the Renaissance. It's a, a method of discovering how to create accurate senses of depth. Now, in the past, in this example, there were senses of perspective, but they were never quite accurate. There's this ongoing debate about whether perspective was invented during the Renaissance or only rediscovered in the Renaissance. There are a few pictures from the classical world. This thing comes uh, from the Roman period. This is the first century. And you can see that they have a sense that things get smaller in the background, but you'll notice that some lines go other directions. It's not quite accurate. It seems more accurate to me to say that in the classical world, people had a sense of perspective, but they really hadn't figured out the mechanics of it. You can see um, the difference between true perspective and what we might call isometric or orthogonal perspective. That is where all of the lines are the same length. And it gives you this kind of bird eye view looking into things rather than a true perspective where things diminish in size and converge into the background. This is the same kind of perspective that you saw in the works of, say, the School of Giotto, uh, where you see this kind of funky isometric shapes. It's also what you see in the international uh, Gothic style, uh, where there really isn't a concrete or mechanical way to understand space. And this continues on into the early Renaissance in the North. Uh, if you look at examples, we'll take, come back and take a look at this when we talk about the North, but when you look at examples such as uh, the Marode altarpiece, none of the perspective lines actually add up. It's kind of a mess. And in fact, to be honest, uh, the North never really cares as much about perspective as the South does. Uh, that if you even go to the works of the 17th century of Rembrandt, Rembrandt's perspective lines are all over the place. Uh, you know, you can just imagine, you know, so go to a, go to a museum and, and say, you know, what a hack, he can't even do perspective. Uh, would be funny. Uh, and it's something that is peculiar to the Italian Renaissance. It happens very slowly and it doesn't happen uniformly. For example, you can see that in works by Fra Angelico, he is working towards a kind of mathematical perspective. The lines are converging. He's trying to create a believable space. But if you look at this 
this over here looks very flat. It doesn't look very believable. Um, this room looks too small for the figures that are inside of it. So how did we get to actual mathematical perspective? Well, there's two stories uh, I'm going to tell you, a kind of official story and an unofficial story. Uh, the official story is that this was invented by Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi lost the competition for the doors at the baptistry, but he is generally credited for the invention of perspective. This is an animation made by Bob DeWitt. Bob DeWitt's a professor at uh, UVU, and he teaches uh, 4D uh, graphics as well as art history. So it's really nice that he knocked this together. Uh, so here you can see, this is an experiment that Brunelleschi performed. He actually went to... Uh, the plaza in front of the baptistry and set up an easel and he applied a polished a silver sheet with a mirror-like shine to the panel so he could see the reflection of the baptistry. He then traced those lines onto the silver and used that to create and paint a duplicate. Then he actually drilled a hole through the panel so that you could hold the panel up and look at the image and hold up a mirror and you could see that the mirror and the actual original would line up. So by this kind of experimentation, he supposedly recreated this idea of one point mathematical or linear perspective. And the official story is that this is an invention of the genius of Western peoples from uh, the Renaissance forward. There's actually a heck of a lot more to this story. I teach non-Western art, so I gotta do this. I gotta tell you. Uh, the truth is, perspective actually has a very, very old heritage, and it actually goes back uh, to Muslim scholarship. Um, there was a character by the name of Ibn al-Hatham. Uh, he was often regarded as the first scientist, the first person to kind of clarify what would become the scientific method. And he was living in the 10th and 11th centuries in... Cairo and other locations. And he wrote a book, uh, the Kitab al-Manazir, uh, or in Latin, De Optica, a book of optics. And he was the first person to come up with what was considered to be the passive theory of sight. Now, up until his time, people thought that the eye was a kind of magical organ that reached out the kind of magical ray and grabbed images of things. This is the active theory of sight. But he was experimenting with things uh, like the camera obscura. The camera obscura was an invention that had been known. Here you can see a kind of diagram of it, but here's a, a better diagram of it. A camera obscura is literally a dark room. And in that dark room, there is a tiny pinhole. And people notice that if you put up a, a sheet of paper or a sheet or a, something on the far side, and you had a bright sunlit day on the outside, that Images from the outside would appear magically on the interior, projected, but they would be upside down. And um, Ibn al-Hatham realized that the only way to understand this was to uh, accept a passive theory of sight. That is, rather than the eye reaching out and grabbing an image, the eye was receiving light, and that that light must travel in straight lines. And you can see that light travels through straight lines right here, and from the top of the tower. And if the pinhole only allows light of straight lines, that's why the image appears reversed. Eventually, many centuries later, this will be add to the invention of the camera and a whole bunch of others. But Ibn al-Hatham was curious about these experiments, and he postulated that the human eye was in fact a kind of camera obscura. And so he did experiments dissecting cow's eyes and looking at them and discovered that they had the same form. And in this process, he realized why things get smaller when they're further away. I know that sounds really stupid. <laughs> Sometimes the most uh, intelligent observations are the ones that explain the obvious. Why do things get smaller when they're further away? Why on earth are things reduced down in size? And I have this wonderful diagram to explain it. If you imagine the eye here, uh, with the lens in the center, you can see that these two figures, the yellow and the red, are exactly the same size. But of course, if you inscribe them on the inside of this eye, you can see that the angle of view for the red one is much larger than for the yellow one. That is, the farther it gets away, the smaller an angle it occupies inside your eye. 
and he realized, and he described this in detail, that this meant at some point everything would fundamentally vanish, that the angle of view would become so small that you can't see it. And you can demonstrate this by looking, standing on railroad tracks. Have you ever stood on railroad tracks on a flat surface? Well, first you shouldn't, that's dumb. Uh, you could get hurt that way. But if you have, you can see that the railroad tracks eventually converge in the distance into what we call the vanishing point. And by plotting all lines to this vanishing point, you can create an accurate mathematical perspective. And we call this a mathematical perspective because it's not art. It's not anything that has to do with you figuring it you know, out or intuiting it. It's mathematical. If you get a ruler and a line and plot it out, you can make it happen. Now, what's interesting is that all the mechanics of how perspective work are there in Ibn al-Hatham's treatise. And he said, okay, that's interesting. And he put it aside. Uh, <laughs> he was interested in aesthetics. He did write on aesthetics, but Islamic aesthetics were based on completely different principles on things like Islamic calligraphy, geometry, the arabesque, etc. And so it was not something that he was interested in pursuing, but all the math and all of the explanation for it was there. Why is this critical? Because um, the Kitab al manasir was translated into Latin and came over to uh, the European world and a copy of that, translated into Latin and known as De Optica, was actually in the possession of Lorenzo Ghiberti and Lorenzo Ghiberti's workshop. And Brunelleschi actually worked in Lorenzo Ghiberti's workshop uh, before he went off on his own. Now, the chance that Brunelleschi didn't pick up De Optica and know about this is, is, is becoming vanishingly small. It's like its own vanishing point is disappearing. So we, it's important to recognize that uh, perspective is not the the creation of any one person, certainly not Brunelleschi. Ideas had been working on this, and he had been drawing from a lot of sources. Whatever the case, once perspective is invented, it revolutionizes art. And we quickly see that the mechanics of it are figured out. You even have Albert Durer making woodblocks, explaining how to do it. Here you can see them using a plumb line here, with a weight on it, to plot various points and they have a screen that can be uh, folded away and you can see how those lines are plotted on it to create foreshortening. You know, if you have this ground line, this uh, horizon line and a vanishing line, you can plot out the size of any object. And just to refresh you, that's clearly what's happening in works by Lorenzo Ghiberti, that they're beginning to figure out the mechanics of this perspective, and they're beginning to create believable depth for the first time in Western art. And it's one of these hallmarks of the Renaissance. So very important point. Moving ahead, however, other revolutions are happening as well. Uh, one of the bigger revolutions is this rediscovery of large-scale cast bronze sculptures. This is Donatello. Donatello is our first turtle. And Donatello is significant because he revitalizes large-scale bronzes. This was done through the lost wax technique. Now, I described lost wax technique in 2710, but just as a refresher course, if you want to transfer something like clay into a more permanent medium like bronze, then what you have to do is make a wax copy of that original using a mold. And then that wax copy is inserted into what we call uh, an investment, and the wax is melted out. Here you can see the wax being melted out. Hence, it's called the lost wax. That leaves you with an empty space in the middle that you can then fill back up with molten bronze. And then you can break off the investment, break off the supporting uh, sprue lines, etc. And you have a bronze copy of the original object you had in clay. The ancients, Greeks and Romans, were very good at this technique and were very good at producing huge, large-scale sculptures. Uh, over the Middle Ages, the technique fell out of practice, in part because people lost the technology, but also in part because Christians in the Middle Ages preferred other forms of art, like frescoes and mosaics, so it didn't become as important. So the revitalization of bronze sculpture became a very important part of the Renaissance. So when Donatello did this, it was kind of a marvel. This thing is not quite life-size. Uh, it's about a little over four feet tall, so it's not quite life-size. Uh, a little bit smaller than life size. And I say that as someone who's five foot five. I, I've had a few students who were 
you know, 410 and 411 said, hey, I'm life size. So, no, I mean, I am a person of shortness, so I, I understand and I feel your pain. But moving on. Um, so, and he did it as a single cast. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, uh, the, in the Renaissance, they were doing their best to replicate the classical world. But what's funny is they sometimes didn't know that the classical world kind of cheated. A lot of those classical statues were cast in separate parts and soldered together. Um, but he did this in single cast. It was amazing. It was seen as this huge technological triumph. So the, re the return of full-scale monumental bronzes is definitely a part of this reclaiming the classical past. But there's also something else going on here. Uh, so this is a, a statue of David. And of course, if you know the story of David, David was this young shepherd boy who was destined to become the king of all uh, Israel and Judea. And he is called out to kill Goliath. Goliath is this giant. Uh, he decides not to wear Saul's armor, and instead he kills uh, Goliath with his sling and then chops off his head. So it's the story of the ultimate undergut dog. So here we have it. But as you look at this character, there's a few things interesting. Uh, one, he's nude, which is a little bit odd uh, for a character out of the Bible. And second, he has this fantastic hat. Uh, this hat uh, looks like a big floppy uh, sun hat with flowers and, and leaves on it. It's actually a helmet. It's a metal helmet. You can see him here. He is standing on the head of Goliath, but he's cut off with Goliath's own sword. And then he has this wonderful flowing locks. Uh, this is not how anyone would have typically imagined David, uh, or at least that's not how you see David in medieval art, even late medieval art. So what is the prototype? Who, where is he looking for this prototype? Uh, and this, you have to get into the discussion of Mercury or Hermes. Mercury was a Roman god. And as chance would have it, Mercury was also known as a slayer of giants. There's these myths about him slaying giants. And so now we have a very puzzle, puzzling issue. Is this David or is this Mercury? Is this a pagan god or is this uh, the King David out of the Judeo-Christian tradition out of the Bible? And the answer to that question is we don't really know. This is made as a private commission so it's not something that would have been publicly displayed. Uh, but the classical nudity to show off the, the heroic male nude, the contraposto pose, the weight shift, the, the attributes of the helmet, all of this is classical. So what we think is going on here is, this. remember, this is the time of humanism, and in humanism they are rediscovering the classical past. In rediscovering the classical past, they want to bring the classical past into the present. But there's a problem. The problem being, uh, the past is pagan, and this is a very, very Catholic uh, place, a very, very Christian place at this point. And you can't just do nudes, and you can't just do pagan gods, because that's not right. That's uh, against the Christian tradition. So this appears to be an image of David, but it is David done in the style of a classical figure, Mercury. In other words, we are kind of fudging it over. You know, we can get away with depicting a statue of Mercury in a classical style if we give it this Judeo-Christian uh, kind of gloss. Uh, it's a way of fudging this over. And it shows that they're still kind of nervous about moving to purely classical forms, but they're working themselves up in that direction. And you can see that in other works of Donatello. Donatello went on to perfect bronze casting, and we start to see massive, huge, monumental bronze castings. One of his uh, most famous is this. Uh, this is Gatamalata, or Honeycat, which was this general in Padua. And so they create this monument to him. A year he wears incredible armor, he has this long sword. But even then, the idea of an equestrian pa uh, a portrait goes back to the Roman period. This is the equestrian uh, portrait of Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor. And this particular portrait of Marcus Aurelius would have been on public display in uh, the Quattrocento. This was actually outside the Lateran Palace. The Lateran Palace was the uh, papal palace at the time in Rome. Uh, this statue had been misidentified as Constantine, Constantine being the first Christian emperor. They said, okay, we'll keep it around. The pagan emperors we may get rid of, but we'll keep this one around. It's not a Constantine, it's actually uh, Marcus Aurelius. So this statue here would have been outside the Lateran Palace in Rome, which means that 
Donatello could have seen it, and he definitely could have tried to emulate that same heroic quality of the ruler, uh, the, van the, the vanquishing hero on a horse. So let's go to Brutaleski. So Brutaleski comes in, and Brutaleski loses the competition for the baptistry doors, but he's also an incredible architect and the innovator of mathematical perspective, but he actually wins a very prominent uh, competition to complete the dome of the Florence uh, Cathedral. So the, the cathedral, more properly known as Santa Maria del Fiore, uh, St. Mary of the Flowers, or commonly called the Domo, uh, was begun in 1297. This is something that people don't know. It was actually begun a lot earlier and uh, was not finished until much, much later. The nave and the choir, as you can see there, were finished in 1337, but he doesn't get around to building the dome until nearly 100 years later. So when you see the Domo today, you can see how it dominates the landscape of Florence. It is just incredible. Uh, it's just head and shoulders above everything else. But it was built in many ways as a response to this building. So you remember Siena? Siena is the city just a little bit to the south of Florence, and it was a major power. It was actually, quite frankly, a, a more important city in the Trecento than Florence was. Florence is the up-and-coming city. Tre um, you know, Siena is the kind of more established city. And they had built a massive cathedral in a Gothic style, in the Gothic period. Here's the interior of it. Yes, that polychromy is uh, unique. Uh, that's the way they loved it. Uh, they had serpentine marble, and so they did it that way. Uh, and it was a sore point to Florence that Siena had such a massive cathedral. Uh, you know, now we build sports venues and we build malls and skyscrapers to compete with each other. Uh, but back then they built cathedrals. These cathedrals are much bigger than the population actually requires. Uh, they're built as statements of civic pride and public pride. Well, uh, Florence was going to build its own cathedral, but then they discovered that Siena came up with an incredible and audacious plan. This is the existing cathedral, but they said, hey, what if we build a massive nave out this direction, and then we'll turn this, the, the current nave, into a transept, thereby, you know, more than doubling the scale of this cathedral and making it this massive project. Uh, as it turns out, they never finished. They ran through all their money uh, and they kind of bankrupted the project. And so you can actually see the uncompleted nave on this side. This is the unfinished new cathedral. But at the time, this really, really irked Florence. Florence was like, no way are we going to be outbuilt by Siena. And so you can see that they decided to get rid of the original church that they had right here and build a massive colossal church, which was this plan right here. But then when they discovered that Siena was going to build theirs even bigger, they said, oh, no, you don't. And they built an even larger octagon on the end to actually finish it out. Except there was one small problem. They built the thing far larger than they had the technology to finish at the time. <laughs> they built this huge octagon and they looked up in the sky and they're like, wow, that's big. How do, how do, how do we cover that with a dome? And they had no idea. Nobody had any idea. And so for more than 80 years, that thing was open to the sky. Uh, it's so funny. We, we look at this building and we think of this building as a kind of unified building. Uh, and we credit it as part of the Renaissance. But it's only this part here, the dome, uh, that was built during the Renaissance. Uh, everything else was built in the previous era in the late Gothic period. Uh, so here you can see the unfinished section. It still remains unfinished today. Large parts of this. Um, they were building a, a chunk around the outside, and according to the rumor, Michelangelo criticized it and said it looked like a cricket's cage, so they stopped, and so it never was finished. But the dome was finished. But when we look to the exterior of the structure, it is, in fact, very much a Gothic structure. You can see that it has uh, Gothic uh, tracery, Gothic crockets and details, a rose window on the front facade. When you get to the interior, it has compound piers and it has Gothic vaulting. It has these rib vaults, these pointed rib vaults. So it feels very Gothic. 
So when Brutaleski came along to the project, uh, one thing that he did is he kind of kept the kind of pointed aesthetic of it to kind of fit the building. So the building was uncovered for nearly a century. And this became a, a sore embarrassment to the people of Florence, that they have this gigantic cathedral and no dome over the top of it. So they put out a, a competition, much like they'd had several years earlier for the baptistry doors, to finish it off. Uh, and no one really quite knew how to finish it off. Uh, and there were several things that were suggested. Uh, I think the most absurd was is, uh, somebody said, hey, uh, you know, let's fill the whole thing with earth. And we'll use earth and we'll pack the earth down tight. You can build the dome on top of the earth. And then you'll have to tunnel and remove the earth from underneath it. And people were like, well, how on earth, you know, are you, we don't have the workforce to do that. How could you get the earth out once you get it up there? And so the suggestion was, oh, we'll seed it with gold coins. So it'll be like a big treasure hunt. So everybody will come and hunt for the gold coins. Of course, then you have the problem is like, well, who's going to see the gold coins? And how do you know they're not going to steal them? Uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti's plan was to fill this with a forest of wooden scaffolding uh, to support the dome while it was being built. The problem being is by this time uh, through the Middle Ages, most of the forests have been denuded. There wasn't enough timber to actually do it. So Brunelleschi uh, was rather hesitant at first that he actually made them pursue them uh, to actually figure it out. But he did have a plan and little by little uh, he released it. And he completed this dome out of a concrete and brick shell. Uh, a brick shell that's on the interior here. You can see there's actually a hollow space between. And the genius between this is he invented what we come to term a kind of chained dome. That is, there are a series of horizontal strengthening members that go around this dome. And here you can see some of them. Some of them were made out of wood. Some of them were made out of brick. And the way this works is that he realized that you don't need to put scaffolding inside this thing to support it. That as long as the upper ring is tied or chained together, it's going to compress the dome in such a way that it's going to hold it up. Now, the best way I can think of to describe this is, I don't know if you guys actually did this on the playground, but when we were kids on the playground in elementary school, we would all get together in a big ring and we would all put our hands over on top of each other's soldiers. You could put 20 people in a ring. And then you would do this thing where you would all lean in simultaneously. And of course, what happens if you lean in simultaneously? You can lean in amazingly far, far farther than you actually could on your own without falling over. But because this ring of people is supporting you, it locks it in and it prevents it from collapsing. So that's what these rings did. These wooden rings and these rings did, they chained it in. So as long as he had that uh, ring on the top, that it was secure, then it would be self-supporting. This, this made it absolutely maddening for the, uh, the bricklayers and the workers on it because the scaffolding actually hung from the dome itself. Uh, and of course, you're looking down into the abyss of the open, uh, you know, octagon below. That made it very nerve wracking. They had a hard time finding people to do it, but they actually managed to do it. He also very cleverly laid out the bricks in an interlocking herringbone pattern that you can see here. So the bricks interlocked as he went up. Eventually, the dome got uh, closed off and uh, it, it succeeded uh, immensely. Uh, and was really kind of a marvel. It's not quite as big as the Pantheon in Rome. The Pantheon in Rome is uh, nearly 150 feet. Uh, this one was about 125 feet, but it was the largest dome created since antiquity. And that's important that again, there was this striving for the creation of something that had been lost. Now, as I mentioned, the dome itself follows the aesthetic of the building. It has this wonderful kind of pointed vault texture so that it fits in with the Gothic structure. But Brutaleschi himself was more interested in recreating the classical architecture of the past. And so we see in some of his independent commissions where he's 
not trying to cludge together a solution that fits the existing building, but he's free to build however he wants, we see that he's even more uh, classical. So nearby was a foundling uh, hospital, an orphanage, Ospedale delle Innocente, which was designed to support foundlings, etc. And here you can see this is the building from above, and it have this massive open courtyard that shows the facade of the structure right here. And then it goes into a courtyard. Uh, so here is the facade. And this is the courtyard here. Here is the facade. And here's the courtyard. Now when you look at this, you'll notice that the arches here are not pointed. That they're perfectly semicircular. And this is a kind of a step backward. This is back to the ideas of the Romanesque period and even back to the classical period. He wants to revitalize this classical language. When you look at these arches, not only are they perfectly semicircular, but they are not supported by compound piers, as would have been the decision in the Middle Ages. They are on columns, with column capitals and columns and bases in a classical style. And we have this sense of perfect rhythm. All of the arches are perfectly concentric with the arches behind them. Uh, the windows above have semicircular arches, and it gives this sense of order. That's one of the things that classical architecture did really well, is it gave this sense of order. Medieval art could be quite bizarre. You could have one arch different than another. You could have bays of different widths. You could have one tower different than another. People in the Middle Ages weren't particular about those things. If you could finish something off, whatever style, great. Uh, but classical order informed your expectations. It gave this rhythm, these repeating bays, and that's what he was seeking. Perhaps uh, one of the most, most famous commissions is going to be the Pazzi Chapel. So this is Santa Croce. Santa Croce was one of the major churches in Florence at the time. And if you are a very rich family, you could have a private chapel added to this so that you could have masses done uh, and burial plots for your deceased. And so the Pazzi family came along and they commissioned this chapel right here. So let's go into the courtyard and take a look at it. Right away, if you remember the 2710 course, this should look some familiar to a lot of classical things that we've seen before. Right off the bat, notice that we have a classical facade. We have an architrave and columns, not compound piers. We have a single semicircular arch. This whole thing here looks almost exactly like a triumphal arch from the Roman period. It's incredible. In fact, the height of the thing and the breadth of the thing are identical. It's a perfect square. And the arch comes right in the center of that square. Um, they, the people of the Renaissance really believed that the classical art was based on this very strong geometrical order. As it turns out, they overinterpreted classical art. Uh, you know, I know you've heard all the stories about uh, of the golden mean and etc. Uh, the truth is, while the ancients knew about the golden mean, there's no real evidence that they organized their architecture by it. But in the Renaissance, they thought they did. They thought they organized around these classical, uh, well, I mean, not just classical shapes, but these mathematical shapes. And so there is a perfect geometric harmony to the Pazzi Chapel. It is exactly double in height of the width of the nave. And so you look up and you see a dome framed perfectly within the square. Well, that brings us to Masaccio. So Masaccio is often regarded as the father of the Italian Renaissance in painting. So if Brunelleschi is responsible for the Italian Renaissance in architecture, and Donatello is responsible for the Italian Renaissance in sculpture, Masaccio is the Italian uh, father of the Renaissance in painting. And he's the first to make extensive use of mathematical perspective to a degree that we've never seen before. Now his name was actually Tommaso, uh, but the name Tommaso is often shorted to the nickname Maso. Uh, but as it turns out, in the uh, master's shop that he was working in, there were already two Thomases that existed. 
there was uh, Masone, which means big tom, and there was a Masolino, which means tiny or delicate tom. And so he got the very unfortunate nickname of Masaccio, which is ugly or clumsy tom. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. This is supposedly a self-portrait he painted. Eh, he's not a bad guy. He could get some dates. Uh, but at any rate, not too bad. So Masaccio uh, was trained uh, alternately in Ghiberti's workshop, but he also worked under Masolino, which we'll talk about more. But right off the bat, he is the one that realizes the true potential of this breakthrough of mathematical perspective. And we see it first in this work. Uh, which is known as the Trinity, and it's located in Santa Maria Novella. Now, again, as I mentioned before, if you were a rich person and you wanted to fund the church, you could have a shrine built in the church to your favorite patron saint, and then that saint uh, would then, you know, have masses said in front of it so that these would, you know, honor your ancestors. This could also be a cenotaph, a place to bury your uh, your deceased loved ones inside the church. So this was a major way of, of people funding churches and the patrons of the church. Uh, but what Masaccio does here is really remarkable. This is the painting right here. You can see it again in this one. And as you can see, it's not an actual chapel. It's just a flat painting. But through the miraculous use of one-point perspective, if you stand at just the right spot, it looks like this recedes into the far wall. That is, the mathematical perspective makes it look as if there's a real space beyond there. And it opens up to this scene where you see God the Father supporting Christ and then you have almost like a collar around God the Father, the dove. You have the figures representing the Trinity. They are flanked on either side uh, by Mary and John. Uh, and then on the next tier out, we have the actual patrons themselves. These are the husband and wife that paid for this. So they want to be included into this scene as well. Notice, interestingly enough, that uh, the man is on the side of the Virgin Mary. And notice that the men are also wearing pink and the women are wearing blue. That's because pink was regarded as a more masculine color. It was kind of like Red Junior. Uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was the more masculine color and blue was the feminine color. It's not until the 19th century that we switch back and we go, we switch to the way we are today, where we think blue is masculine and pink is feminine. Uh, pink is a very masculine color, guys. Uh, wear it with pride. But also notice that there's some odd things going here that you would assume that the male would want to be on the side of John and not the other way around. Uh, sometimes we get gender roles really mixed up because of our expectations. Uh, the Virgin Mary was a very, very popular figure, particularly with... Uh, male donors and male patrons and uh, rulers of male um, you know, dominated families. You don't think of Mary as a patriarchal figure, but in a way she kind of was. It's kind of fascinating. But let's put all that aside for a minute and talk about this perspective again. So if you stand in a particular spot, everything in this lines up perfectly as if this were a real chapel. Do you remember what I said about um, Giotto? back in the day that Giotto was actually very highly valued because he could save his patrons money. That is, he could paint valuable materials like Marmo Antico or uh, Gian Giallo Antico or Serpentine or Porphyry. He could paint those materials and fake it, <laughs> but they looked good. They looked real. So, you know, skill was being elevated because you could provide value to your customer. You could provide value to your patron by painting stuff that looked real, but wasn't real. You could save your boss money and it still looks just as good. So, hey, it's a double win. The same thing is going on here. Instead of having to actually to build, knock out a wall and build a chapel outside of the church, you now have an artist that can say, hey, I can do it in paint and I can fake it. Now, we're so used 
to the way this looks that we don't see this as really revolutionary. But I think you have to understand this as they understood it at the time. No one had ever created such believable depth in space before in a painting. And so seeing something like this really would have been just gobsmacking to somebody in the Quattrocento. The only thing I can think of that's analogous to it today are these wonderful anamorphic chalk drawings. These are anamorphic chalk drawings by uh, a street artist known by Julian Beaver. Uh, and he paints these anamorphic projections. An anamorphic projection is something that is, an image that is distorted when you look at it, you know, one way, but when you look at it another way, it magically snaps into the perspective. <coughs> For example, you can see here that this snail looks like she's, the snail looks like it's crawling up onto the bench and this poor lady is turning around to, to confront this monumental snail. When in reality, all of that is out here in the street and this image shows you that. I really love how he's incorporated this pole here as one of the uh, uh, stalks, eye stalks or antenna of the, of the snail. And people look at these things, it's like, wow, it's really magical. It looks like it's really there in three-dimensional space until you look at it from the other way. Here's another one of his, it's very similar. This one, it looks like he's standing on a globe um, that he's a tiny little figure standing on a globe that's floating in space. But when you see it from another direction, you realize how far he stretched it out. So I think that's how we have to imagine these paintings, that they're like those anamorphic chalk drawings. They fool the eye. They give you a sense of wonder and magic. It's like, oh, wow, how did he do that? We don't see that because we're so used to, you know, believable images. We just kind of accept it. Um, it's the magic trick is we, we know what the magic trick is in it now. And of course, knowing the magic trick doesn't make it any more magical. It just, you know, kind of defeats the purpose. But for the people at the time, this would have been like this, like, wow, how did he pull that off? This of course leads Masaccio to a number of, uh, greater, uh, you know, uh, commissions. And that leads us to the Brancacci Chapel. So uh, the Church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence is, you know, not much to look at by the exterior. Uh, the interior had a Baroque uh, redo, but off to the side, there is a chapel. So under all of this here in this cutaway is this chapel. And this was a private chapel made for the Brancacci family. And this is often regarded, it's sometimes called the Sistine Chapel of the early Renaissance, that it is one of the most important and influential works of its time that spread the influence of Masaccio far and wide. It's not a terribly large chapel. As you can see, it's, it's pretty small, but the paintings on the wall really are remarkable. Now, this is actually uh, an earlier icon and everything here was painted later. So we're mostly just considered concerned with what's on these walls here. So the story of the Brancacci Chapel is actually very, very complicated. The Brancacci family uh, had close associations to the papacy, and so they wanted to highlight that. And so their patron saint was St. Peter. So they commissioned Masolino, who was Masaccio's master at the time, they commissioned him to paint this, but Masolino actually gets interrupted. He actually gets a, a much more prestigious commission to go paint for the king of Hungary in uh, Budapest. And so he leaves. He just abandons the Brancacci Chapel. Uh, and so he is responsible largely for painting this wall uh, and this material over here. Although even then, uh, you know, uh, Filippo Lippi had to come in and, and fix it up. There's actually a lot of hands on that side of the wall. And so since he decided to say, yeah, bye, see ya, uh, and he went yeet uh, and left for uh, Budapest, uh, suddenly this fell into the lap of his apprentice, Masaccio. Well, it actually turns out it's probably the best thing that ever happened because Masaccio completely changed the style and went in a new direction. So while the right half here is painted by Masolino, this half is almost entirely painted by Masaccio. So let's take a look at the Masolino side for a bit. Here we have scenes from the later life of, of Peter. You can see Peter is uh, raising the invalid. 
uh, here he is uh, uh, raising um, is it the daughter of Jairus. Oh my gosh, I, I can't remember. I guess I failed Sunday school. Uh, over here we have his crucifixion. Peter was crucified upside down by Nero because he didn't feel like he was worthy to die the same way as Christ. So all of you who uh, wear your upside down crosses because you think it's really metal, I hate to break it to you, uh, that's just really the cross of St. Peter. So we have scenes from the story of St. Peter. When we look at these scenes, you'll notice that they tend to be brightly lit. Uh, the architecture isn't bad. Uh, you have shadows. Some shadows are going this way. Some shadows are going this way. There's no universal light. Uh, when we look up here, we have a scene of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in the fall, uh, and they kind of float on the scene. Compare this to the other wall, and automatically you can see a dramatic difference. There's far greater depth in the background. The figures are more closely composed. They all are next to each other, giving a more believable sense of depth. The shadows are all in the same direction as if there is one global light coming from this direction. The architecture, everything about it, is far more believable. And this is the influence of perspective uh, coming here. Let's take a look at this scene. This is probably the most famous scene. This is the story of the tribute money. So the story of the tribute money is that uh, a tax collector, a publican, one of these private contractors hired by the Roman army to shake down people for their tax money, comes along. And uh, of course, publicans were universally hated because they would always shake down for more money than they were supposed to. Notice that you can always tell the publicans because the publicans are dressed in contemporary dress to indicate that they are not spiritual figures. Here's a more detailed view of this, just to kind of blow this up. And here you can see the publican is dressed in contemporary dress, and he appears twice, once here and once here. Again, we have another example of this continuous or conflated narrative. All of these uh, sacred people, the saints, the apostles, are shown uh, wearing classical dress. Now, people you know, at this time, they weren't stupid. They knew that there was a certain kind of, there were changes in fashion. So this deliberate dichotomy between the two fashion styles is deliberate. Uh, it is it is an attempt to show that this person is not of the spiritual dimension, whereas these individuals are. It's kind of a really interesting detail. But moving on, you can see that the story goes that Peter comes, the publican comes and asks for the tax money. Uh, Peter says, is it lawful for us to pay tax to... You know, this occupying force of the Romans. And Jesus says, you know, basically all things are to God, but let's not offend. Uh, so go and fish and go catch a fish. And when you catch a fish, shake it out and a coin will fall out of its mouth. So Peter does as he's told. You can see here his, his robe is off to the side. You can always recognize Peter because Peter's colors are always the same. He's always in orange and blue. Notice he's always in orange and blue. I don't know. Maybe he's a Broncos fan. I guess somebody has to be. Anyhow, I just lost all my Denver audience, didn't I? Okay, moving on. Uh, so here you can see, here he is. He gets the fish. He shakes the fish out, and a coin magically falls out of its mouth. And he goes over, and he puts the money into the, the publican's hand. So it's a story of the miracle. And so at one level, it's, it's a kind of charming little story. But the other thing is the perspective is just astonishing. All of the mathematical perspective lines align in Christ, the vanishing line. So he is using the perspective to focus you in on the person of Christ and to frame the story. All of the light is consistent as if this were shot at one time. There's none of these funky shadows going off in various different directions, like on Masolino's wall. Instead, all the shadows line up so that they all feel like they are in the same space. The same thing is true of the lower panel. So in the lower panel, uh, we can see him in various scenes raising uh, a young man from the dead. Uh, he also is in prison over here, but all the heads are kind of at the same dimension. Here is this miraculous image of Peter uh, that's being venerated, and it's tucked out over here is where uh, you can see uh, Masaccio has painted himself, and we think perhaps he's painted an image of Masolino. So maybe he's put his self-portrait there. Going back to the scene on the other side, you notice that 
nothing like that kind of organization of space or really well-structured space exists. And I think perhaps the most dramatic difference is when you compare the scenes of Adam and Eve. So up here we have a scene of Adam and Eve. This is Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, Adam and Eve are being tempted by the serpent. The serpent is commonly portrayed in medieval and Renaissance art as having a woman's head, so that's rather sexist. Uh, the, the head looks rather like Eve herself. It was this common view that women brought sin into the world, but again, uh, you can hold me responsible for my jokes against the, the Denver Broncos. You can't hold me responsible for my jokes uh, for, for the sexist views of the Middle Ages. It's just what it was. Not me. Yeah, so, uh, But when we look at these figures, notice how tall they are. Notice how small and compact their heads are. There's no shadows underneath them. Uh, they don't really feel rooted. They float on the surface. Notice also that the light appears to be coming from this direction. Adam stands in front of Eve and his body is in shadow, but somehow her body is uniformly lit and doesn't respond to the fact that he would be blocking any light coming from this direction. Now compare this to this scene on this side. So that is the fall and this is the expulsion. And in this case, you can see the expulsion of Adam and Eve. The angel is above them, driving them out of the Garden of Eden. Look how strongly rooted they are to the ground by the cast shadows. Notice how much more accurate uh, the light is. The light is consistent from the one direction. Notice also the expressions of grief and sadness. Uh, there's really just a night and day difference between these two images. These figures are more or less still coming out of the tradition of the International Gothic. Long, lithe, beautiful figures, anatomically accurate enough, and uh, well enough for, for, the, for this, you know, you know, but otherwise they kind of float. They don't exist in a real space with real shadows. These figures are real. Uh, their grief is real. I love how Adam uh, doesn't cover him his uh, anatomy. He covers his face because it's his face, his, his identity that is the source of shame. When you look at the Eve, the Eve in her gesture is borrowed from a classical work of art. Uh, this gesture that you see here um, is a gesture that comes from the Capitoline Venus. It's a very famous piece of classical art that would have been known to the time. So there is, again, this strong-rooted historicism in the Italian Renaissance. Uh, but notice that we have two very different styles being painted at roughly the same time period, that you have Masolino and his kind of more international Gothic style, and you have Masaccio in this more rooted, clearly Italian Renaissance style. And it's this style that's going to go on and inspire so many figures. This is the style that's going to inspire uh, people like Piero della Francesca when he makes his Magnificent Flagellation of Christ, where you could see all the perspective lines uh, draw us in to this scene of Christ being whipped at the column. He gives us a kind of believable foreground and background. Again, the mixture of people in classical and secular contemporary dress. Uh, Pontius Pilate over here is dressed wearing a big funny hat uh, that would have been a typical kind of hat or title that indicated somebody who was a duke or, uh, or a person of ruling class to separate him from Christ, who is dressed in a classical style. But then we have these contemporary figures brought in that are almost certainly donor portraits that are paying for this. All of this is coming from Masaccio. Uh, Francesca is getting this from Masaccio. And you're going to see this kind of split emerge in the Renaissance uh, between those who were the followers of Masaccio and those who were the followers of Fra Filippo Lippi. So Fra Filippo Lippi is an interesting character. He's one of the funnest characters to read about in uh, Vasari's uh, Lives of the Artists. He starts off as a, uh, a kind of ne'er-do-well boy who gets uh, put into a monastery to kind of straighten him out, uh, but he never attends to his studies. He refuses to do his uh, copy work, and instead he doodles all over the margins of these manuscripts that he's supposed to be copying. And his master comes along and says, well, 
Uh, maybe if we train you as an artist, you could be of some worth to God. So instead, uh, they they take uh, Fra Filippo Lippi. Uh, has the funnest name to say in uh, Italian art. Fra just means brother because he was a, a monk. Although we're not even entirely certain if he ever took his vows. And he eventually could be trained to become an artist. He becomes a very, very successful artist. Uh, but a terrible monk. Not a successful monk. At uh, one point, he is... Uh, giving art lessons to a uh, female novice who is supposed to become a nun and she was of noble birth and her name was uh, lucretia Buti. Uh, but he ends up deflowering her and fathering a child by her who ends up being filipino lippy uh little philip uh, so quite the character but he was known for this incredible light ethereal style and so he made these wonderful portraits of Madonnas. Uh, this one is possibly based on uh, the nun he deflowered, Lucretia. Uh, and so you can see we have this wonderful light, elegant touch, long fingers. Uh, and you can see this in many of his Madonnas, this kind of tenderness. But when it comes to perspective, things don't always work out. He's clearly learned something about perspective. The lines are here to create depth, but you'll notice that they don't quite line up. There is no single point that exists. Instead, he emphasizes the delicate nature of the figures um, and their relationship. You can see it especially in this one. We have two kneeling donors. Uh, they don't look like they're kneeling so much like they've been cut off at the waist and stuffed on a table. Uh, the perspectives are wonky and awkward, but the figures, their hands are so delicate and lovely, you can almost overlook that. And this is where we get to a very important point. Always two there are. No more. No less. Uh, that's not bad. Okay. And this is something that I, I want to stress out, is that so many times in the Renaissance, we talk about patronage. Who is paying the bill matters a great deal. But the other thing that matters a great deal is the master and apprenticeship relationship. That... No, there are no art schools. There's a few art guilds. There's the Guild of St. Luke in Florence, which kind of trains artists, but it's not like a, a formal school. Instead, you had to be trained by a master. You had to be accepted by a master, and then you would give it your life to him. Do you ever wonder why 21 is the legal age? I know, it sounds like such an arbitrary number, but this is the way it works. When you were seven years old, you were considered old enough to be apprenticed to a master. So when you were seven years old, you'd be sent off to a master, whoever that master was. Maybe he was a weaver, maybe he was a tailor, maybe he was an artist, maybe he was a goldsmith, whatever. And you would be sent, and for seven years, you would essentially be the indentured servant to that master. And by the time you reached 14, you were a little bit more of an advanced apprentice. You would actually know enough that you could do some things on your own, but you had learned the trade. But now you had to work an additional seven years to pay him back for teaching you how to be, uh, how to do this profession. Well, okay, so seven to 14, 14 to 20. Oh, there we go. That's why 21 is the legal age because that was the first year you would be free from your master and you could go on your own. And then you could actually journey, you could travel, you could meet other members of the guild, learn things that they learned. That's why you have these journeyman status and trades and professions today. So there's still echoes of these, these ways of learning. And so that was the way you learned as an artist. You didn't get another option. You, if you wanted to be an artist, you had to be a master. And so you can see the transmission of styles. It's not an accident that uh, Filippo Lippi has this very much influenced style that is influenced by international Gothic. It's live and elegant. And would you be surprised to know that he trained this guy, uh, Sandro Botticelli. So those are the same characteristics we see in Sandro Botticelli. So who the master is matters because that's the transmission. What you're going to see by the time we get into the second half of the Quattrocento, which is next discussion, the second half of the Quattrocento, you have kind of two tracks. Uh, Masaccio dies young. He dies in his 20s. He accomplished so much, but he died in his 20s. He never got the chance to have his own apprentices. Um, but his stuff was so influential that Piero del Francesco and other figures uh, really loved his foreshortening, his perspective, all of that. Um, I mean, it's really kind of incredible because 
uh, when you look at uh, when you look at uh, his perspective, he was so committed to creating things in real space that he even makes the halos like dinner plates on people's heads. He even renders the halos in three-dimensional space. It's really kind of amazing. So Masaccio didn't have any apprentices, but he was so influential, those people will pick up his ideas and they will pass it on to his apprentices. So you have people like Ghirlandaio. Ghirlandaio picks up from Masaccio and Ghirlandaio ends up having an apprentice by the name of Michelangelo. And so Michelangelo picks up his foreshortening and perspective from Ghirlandaio, who's getting it from Masaccio. Uh, uh, Alessandro Botticelli is picking it up from his this live international style. He's picking that up from uh, Fra Filippo Lippi. So apprenticeship matters. It matters a great deal. And it's how this information and how these styles are transmitted. And we'll see this as we get into the next section. Verrocchio, Perugino, Raphael, all part of the same, Leonardo as well, all part of the same group of people being trained in the Veneto and in, in the area of Perugia. Okay, so that's a good place to wind this up. We'll stop here and we'll pick up next time with the High Renaissance, how we get to the High Renaissance. But there's a little bit we have to cover about what's happening in the North. Um, there's some interesting things happening in the North. Most importantly, the invention of oil painting. But we'll save that for next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.